legs are not too short and not too long, the ones whose teeth are not too blunt and not too sharp, because if they're too sharp, they might break easily. Natural selection, nature, is constantly choosing which individuals shall live, which individuals shall breed. And the result, after many generations of natural selection, is much the same as the result after many generations of artificial selection. So what would it take to change the Arthromorph program so that it simulated natural selection instead of artificial selection? Because at present, the Arthromorphs are just being chosen by the eyes of a human. Could we somehow make the computer do its own choosing, choosing on the basis of quality of arthromorphs? Well, the trouble is it's not easy to judge what quality in an arthromorph might mean, because these arthromorphs are living in a very strange environment, the two-dimensional computer screen. They don't have a real world in which to live. They don't have predators. They don't have prey. They don't have food that they've got to catch. Perhaps we could do better if we made a computer model of a two-dimensional designoid object, like a spider web. Now, if we could have the lights down, I think we might be able to see... Now, there is a spider in the middle of its web, and that, I think, shows quite nicely. Good. Right, well, you know what a spider web is for. It's for catching flies and other prey. It's a net, and the, it works in two dimensions. It's, we would have liked to have actually shown you a, a spider building its web, but this one seems to be uh, pretty satisfied with the web it's already got. <laughs> so um, what I'm going to do instead is to show you a computer reconstruction of a spider's movements while it builds a web. Now, I have to watch carefully. This is rather speeded up. Can we have that more slowly now, Peter? What the spider's now doing is the radii of the web. Now it's doing the structural spiral, which is a kind of, of uh, scaffolding. And now it's doing the sticky spiral, which is the bit that actually does the business of catching the uh, flies. Let's have it once more slowly. Right. Right, there are the radii. Now it's, now it's doing the scaffolding, and now it's doing the real sticky spiral. What we're seeing there is not actually a picture of the web itself. That's a picture of the movements of a spider that were recorded on a particular day. That's a particular spider on a particular day. Its movements were all fed into the computer, and now the computer is playing it back to us. But that's just a recording of the web of a real particular spider. Now, in order to, to do our trick of making an arthromorph-like program out of spider webs, we've got to make the computer behave like a spider. And this is the program written by Peter Fuchs, who I'm glad to say is next door, uh, controlling the computer. And what his program does is to make the computer build a web as if it was a spider. So the computer is holding in its little head the rules that we know something about, of how a spider builds a web. So the computer does the radii like that. It does the spiral like that. Now, just as in the case of the arthromorphs, what Peter has done is to make the building rules of the computer spider under genetic control. There are genes in the computer, just as there were for the arthromorphs, and just as there were for the arthromorphs, the genes are simply numbers. That is the parent web. These are the daughter webs, more strictly. That's the web that was built by the parent spider. These are the webs that were built by the daughter spiders. Now, to begin with, we can treat this just as if it was an arthromorph program. So we want another volunteer. Let's have a girl this time. Right. Yes, please. What's your name? Ursula. Ursula. Come here, Ursula, please. Have you ever used a computer with a mouse? Yes. Yes, good. So this time it's just like the other one, only you have to click twice instead of once to choose which one you think is the best web. OK, now that web has gone up to the, to the top there. That's now become the parent. And here are the daughter webs that are being drawn. And now you can make, choose another one, another generation. Thank <laughs> you. 
So you see, we're doing just the same as we did for the arthromorphs, but now we've got spider webs coming. <coughs> but the point we were going to go for was not artificial selection. The whole point of doing this with spider webs is to do something like natural selection. And to do that, we simply make the computer work out how good each web would be at catching flies. And we can do that because unlike the case of the arthromorphs, the webs are two-dimensional structures and we know what they're for. They're for catching flies. So the benefit is simply going to be the number of flies caught. And the cost we can calculate because the cost is the amount of silk used. Spider webs are made of silk. So the cost of a web is the amount of silk used and the benefit is the, is the flies. Now, if you'd like to stop now, or, Ursula, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, we no longer have a human selector, we now have the flies doing the selecting. So the flies are going to hit the web, when Peter gets it started up again, and... Right, so now we've got a new generation of webs being built, and we're now going to see the flies hitting the webs, There come the flies, flies again. Now the computer is going to calculate which of the webs is best at catching flies, and it's that one that's gone dark. So that one will now become the parent of the next generation. And now once again the webs are being built, the, ch the, the child webs are being built. Once again the flies will come, the computer will measure which one of them is the best. There it is, and that becomes the parent of the next generation. Now, it wouldn't take very long for us to see the evolution starting from no web at all and going to a nice web that works very well, but we haven't quite got time for it, so um, instead what we did was to let the computer run all night, all last night, and we've got a fossil record of all the webs that were built during that time. This was the starting web, the thing that started at the beginning of the night's run, and then every 20 generations we have a printout of the shape of the web. So we see we start with almost no spiral at all, and you could imagine the flies just whizzing straight through and not getting caught. But then natural selection in the computer led to a gradual improvement in the web, more and more spiral, more and more flies caught, and so evolution went in the direction of a nice full web with a nice full spiral like that, catching lots of flies. That all went on in the computer last night, very fast, telescoping into one night what would have taken thousands of years, perhaps millions of years, in nature. In nature, the successful and the unsuccessful webs would not, of course, be judged by the computer doing a calculation about how many flies would have been caught, would be expected to be caught, They'd be judged automatically, the webs would be judged automatically and without any thought by the flies themselves. The flies themselves just fly into webs, thereby choosing webs for breeding. The flies don't know they're choosing the webs for breeding. They don't particularly want to fly into the webs. But nevertheless, the consequence of their inadvertently flying into webs is that the spider that built the successful web is a spider that's more likely to breed and therefore more likely to pass on the genes for building that sort of web. So as the generations go by, webs get better and better and better, just as they did in the computer in our overnight run. That's natural selection in the case of spider webs, and exactly the same principle works for every living creature, for the bodies of every living creature. Every lion and tiger, every camel, every dog, uh, every human, every giraffe, they all have evolved by the same process of evolution by natural selection. So the Darwinian view is that designoid objects are not designed at all. They have evolved by natural selection. The most popular alternative to the Darwinian view is called creationism. Creationists believe that designoid objects are really designed objects. The only difference is that whereas these designed objects were designed by humans, these designed objects were designed by a divine creator. And the favourite argument of creationists is the so-called argument from design, which was most famously expressed by Archdeacon William Paley in 1802 in the book Natural Theology. 
And Paley begins his book, In crossing a heath, suppose I pitched my foot against a stone and were asked how the stone came to be there. I might possibly answer that for anything I knew to the contrary, it had lain there forever. In other words, the stone is the kind of object which had always been there and doesn't need any special kind of explanation. But, Paley goes on, what if I accidentally kicked a watch? The watch, I open it up, I see the mechanism, I see the cogwheels and the springs, everything about it looks designed. It had to have a designer, it had to have a watchmaker. And if the watch had to have a watchmaker, then how much more, Paley argued, must these objects, these living objects, including ourselves, have had a divine watchmaker. For Paley, it follows as clearly as the night follows the day, that just as the watch had to have a designer, so do we have to have a designer. But of course, just to show that animals and plants look as though they've got a designer, begs the question. I've spent much of this lecture trying to persuade you that animals and plants look as though they've got a designer. But I spent the other half of the lecture showing you that there's a, another very good alternative explanation for why they look as though they had a designer, namely natural selection. Well, Paley, of course, lived before Darwin, so he couldn't be expected to know about the alternative. Nevertheless, it was, even without knowing about Darwin, it was possible back in the 18th century to know that Paley's argument was a pretty bad argument. And this was pointed out by David Hume, one of the greatest philosophers of all time, Hume made the point that the argument from design, which, is, which was Paley's argument, is that things like elephants and humans are too complicated to have come about by chance. They have many parts, just like a watch. Too complicated to have come about by chance. A designer, a watchmaker, an engineer, is certainly one way in which these objects could come about. These objects could come about. But a watchmaker, or a designer, or an engineer, if he's to be any good as a watchmaker or an engineer, must be a pretty complicated object himself. It's no good just postulating a designer, because a designer is just the very kind of thing, just the very kind of complicated, ordered thing, that seems to need the very kind of explanation that we're searching for. If a human is too complicated to have come about by luck, or if a swift is too complicated to have come about by luck, then a thousand times more so, any being capable of creating humans must be too complicated to have come about by luck. The argument from design certainly proves that living things couldn't have come about by chance, but by the same token, even more strongly, it shows that a divine creator couldn't have just come about either. The creator would have needed an even bigger creator, and so on. The argument from design is a powerful seeming argument, and it powerfully shoots itself in the foot. The Darwinian argument of evolution by natural selection, of course, doesn't suffer from this problem. The Darwinian argument does not explain things as due to chance. Chance, in the form of random genetic mutation, comes into it, but by far the most important part of the Darwinian explanation is the non-random process of natural selection. There's another rather interesting little curiosity, which is that natural objects, designoid objects, have imperfections which you, don't, you wouldn't expect to get in objects which were designed by a real designer. <coughs> this is a flatfish, a halibut. Its ancestors once swam normally in the water like a normal fish does, like that. But the ancestors of the halibut settle down on the bottom of the sea, one side down. They lay on the bottom of the sea, and then now a modern flatfish moves along like that. You've probably seen them doing it. But when it did that, the ancestor found that one of its eyes was looking straight into the sand. Only the other one was looking up. And so gradually in evolution, the other eye, the one that was looking into the sand, migrated round the side of the head and came up to the top with the result that the skull of the halibut is now an extremely distorted object. It's like a sort of Picasso painting of a fish. It's got its two eyes on one side. Now, anybody who was going to design a flatfish wouldn't do it that way. 
you'd do it like a skate, which is another kind of shark, which is also a flat fish, and it flattened itself, its ancestors flattened itself, by going onto its belly, so that both its eyes were looking upwards and it had no need to do any kind of distortion. But by some kind of historical accident, the ancestors of the halibut and the soul and the place all did it by lying on their side, and that meant that they had this distortion. So this is an imperfection in design, which is just the kind of thing you'd expect to see if these creatures had evolved, but is very much not the kind of thing you'd expect to see if these creatures had been created. Evolution starts from simple beginnings. The starting point of evolution is the kind of thing we see here, something like crystals, something at least as simple as crystals. And it builds upon simplicity to, to get towards complexity. We start with a simple foundation. Simple things are easy to understand. We don't have to start with a complicated thing like a creator. On this simple foundation are built designoid objects by natural selection. And only when we have designoid objects with brains as big as human brains does design finally emerge. But why do I say just humans for design? Isn't it rather unfair to the wasps that built these pots and bees and spiders and things, rather unfair to this oven bird that built that mud nest, or that nest of social wasps, which is very similar to that, convergently, also built of mud? Why do I use the word design only for human creations and not for the manufacturers of these animals? The difference is that human designs get their goodness and efficiency from conscious human foresight. Wasp pots and oven bird nests get their efficiency directly from natural selection by a kind of hindsight rather than foresight. <coughs> Genes are selected which influence the bodies of the oven bird and the wasps and particularly the nervous systems which influence the building behaviour. The <coughs> birds and the wasps have no idea of why they're doing what they do. Natural selection simply favours those that build good nests. Humans, on the other hand, do build with foresight. At least they do usually. This is an engineer called Ingo Reckenberg from Germany who designs windmills, and he claims that he designs his windmills by a kind of natural selection. Uh, he does it by putting his windmills in a wind tunnel, measuring how good they are, and then, as he calls it, breeding from those windmills that are good at spinning around in a wind tunnel. The windmills have genes, and again, not real genes, but they are 